Bada bing, bada boo. March 1st, 2021. Shailene is working as the manager of the Glen Orchid General Store. It's a cute little two-story shop near the water in Canada. It's almost literally on the lake. It looks like the starting point of every small town romance novel. Customers walk in, they peruse through the snack aisles, they buy their little drinks, but they also sell fishing supplies if you just want to throw a yard right outside. If you're hungry, you can buy fresh fruit, fresh produce. There's picnic tables outside and they sell full on full course meals. It's a cute little community cottage shop. Shailene, the general manager, she pulls up to the parking lot at around 6.30 that morning. They open at 7. And when she pulls up, there's already a dark colored Mercedes SUV parked, perhaps waiting for her to open. It seems like they need something right at seven. So she rushes in. She's getting the store ready. Seven o'clock hits. She whips open the doors and nobody's walking in. That's strange. She gives him more time. She doesn't see that couple in the dark colored SUV walk in until 8 a.m. Another hour later. Maybe they were taking a nap. Who knows? A tall man with brown hair walks in. He's trying to buy some snacks and use the restroom. He's accompanied with what seems to be his girlfriend, an Asian woman with long black hair. The two of them buy a few things. They use the restroom for considerably quite a long time. And then the man turns to his Asian girlfriend and says, she's here. We got to go. Okay, it's a little weird, but Charlene thought maybe they're meeting someone. No big deal. Later that day, she goes to clean up the restroom and she's taken out the wastebasket when she notices that there is another black plastic bag inside the trash can. And she's like, you know what? Let me just open it up. She peeks inside. 40 bullets are inside the bag. Why are there 40 bullets in here? There's clothes, sweatpants. 40 bullets used or unused? Unused. But still, who just trashes bullets? That's crazy, yeah. Clothes, she pulls them out tiny bits of blood on them, a phone charger with blood. And then she pulls out a key, car keys to an Audi Q5, a luxury vehicle. Who just throws away car keys to a car like that? And a blonde wig. So strange. She thinks it's so strange. In fact, she immediately calls the police. She tells them everything. Okay, and ma'am, what did the couple look like? Oh, very good looking. What? The very good looking couple wouldn't be found for months. They're found months later in Eastern Europe. Their names are Oliver and Lucy, but only one of them comes back to Canada, Lucy. And when she lands back in Canadian soil months after this bizarre blonde wig and bullets in the general store trash can, she's taken into this tiny windowless room. It's this interrogation room. And a man sits in front of her and asks her, how's your flight, Lucy? She responds, the food wasn't bad, but not the best flight experience. I'm not used to sitting in tight spaces. The officer chuckles. Yeah, (laughs) flying coach is um, is, uh, is a little bit. And I feel really bad for the officers that had to come and get me because they had to make stopovers, layovers. Oh, before they met with you. Yeah, before they met with you, Lucy, our service allowed them to take some annual leave time. So they got some time to see the city and the sites. They weren't that inconvenienced. (gasps) She puts her hand up to her heart. Yeah, me and my mom was really concerned about that. And we offered um, Interpol to tell them that we'll fly them private. But Interpol declined the offer. Yeah, we can't accept things from uh, things like that. We have to we have to do things with. We have to follow the rules. Wait, her mom wants to fly Interpol police in a private jet? Yes. From Eastern Europe to Canada. Lucy honestly just felt bad for the Canadian officials who had to practically babysit her on this international flight flying economy. The officer responds, oh, thank you for the offer, Lucy, but we can't um, we can't accept things like that from um." the detective looks like he wants to say like suspected murderers like you. This is the murder case of what some people have deemed the Asian Kardashian sisters and how one of them committed murder.
We would like to thank today's sponsors who have made it possible for Rotten Mango to support the SAFE Project, a national nonprofit dedicated to building collaboration to address the addiction epidemic, prevent overdoses, and the mental health challenges that may lead to them. Today's episode's partnerships have also made it possible to support Rotten Mango's growing team, and we would also like to thank you guys for your continued support as we work on our mission to be worthy advocates. As always, full show notes are available at RottenMangoPodcast.com. A few disclaimers for today's case. There are mentions of illegal substance use and dealing. There's also a brief mention of a loss of pregnancy. So with that being said, let's get started. There is a saying when it comes to going to trial for a crime. The best defense is an expensive defense. The second best defense is a free defense. And the worst defense is a cheap defense which has nothing to do with the attorney. There are a lot of passionate attorneys who will defend their clients regardless of how much financial compensation there is at the end. But technically speaking, resources could be the most important thing in a trial. For high profile criminal cases that's gonna go to a full trial, a top criminal defense team could cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not in the millions of dollars range. OJ Simpson's dream team defense adjusted for inflation would have been anywhere between $15 million now. The Enron executives, Ken Lay and Jeff Skilling, they paid nearly $70 million for their defense. There's a few reasons defense teams are pricey. One net is in states, it's not just the attorney standing with you in court. That money pays for half a dozen associates that are sitting in the office solely working on your case, researching every issue, cranking out quality motions at every possible point. It's the private investigators that are digging up every witness and shred of evidence. It's the team of 10 all-star experts, forensic experts, psychiatrists, who are going to wow the jury with their resume and with the way they present the evidence in a way that favors your case. It's the jury consultants that are going to get the best jury panel in that that box for you. That's why money makes a difference. There are plenty of public defenders and cheaper defenders, criminal defense attorneys who have tremendous amounts of experience and are as sharp as any celebrity lawyer. But when you buy a defense, you're not purchasing individual attorney talent. You're bankrolling an army. Another netizen comments on top of that, Powerful people play with powerful people, meaning high profile criminal defense attorneys that get paid the big bucks likely go to parties where the judges are, where the prosecutors are. They probably have better connections and friendships, which can help negotiate plea deals or reduce charges. Which, if accurate, and there must be some truth to it, that there's so many instances of people buying innocence, it's severely depressing. Maybe a topic for another day. Today, though, we are talking about one of the most high-profile established criminal defense attorneys in Canada, Liam O'Connor. He's well-known in Toronto for getting defendants off for things like the attempted murder of a Toronto police officer, alleged hate crimes, conspiring to kill two people, at the same time. I mean, you could say he knows what he's doing. He knows how to defend people. And in the case of Lucy Lee, who some people have dubbed the Asian Kardashian of Canada, he seems to be taking a slightly different approach, a unique approach. He's defending Lucy Lee, an Instagram model and daughter of a wealthy Chinese businesswoman, a well-connected, powerful businesswoman. And in his defense, he states to the jury, Lucy is a distinctively flawed individual. She is naive. She's superficial. She's juvenile. She is entitled. She is immature, sometimes irresponsible. She has terrible taste in men, which is not yet a crime, right? She is full of moral failings. She is perhaps the stupidest person in the room or possibly on the planet. (laughs) This is what she's paying allegedly maybe close to seven figures for. But not because none of that is, is a crime. Yeah, none of that is a crime. And that seems to be the reasoning that he offers on why she tried to murder two people. Lucy Lee is the eldest of three triplets. The Lee family consists of the three triplets and the two other siblings. I think that's why also the Kardashian comes into play. It's a huge family. And Lucy is the eldest of all of them. But let's mainly focus on the triplets. It's Lucy, Caitlin, and Jane. Lucy is the oldest by five minutes. They actually don't go by the name the Lee triplets. They go by the Mia triplets. I'm not sure why. That's what they call themselves. And I cannot exactly tell you how famous the triplets were. It seems like they were pretty well known in the Toronto area, but a lot of their social medias have been more or less wiped. They would post in bikinis or other slightly revealing outfits, the three of them. They're beautiful. I think a lot of people were intrigued by 
really pretty triplets who are also from a really, really well-off family. There are some re-uploaded lives that they've done where they answer people's questions. And honestly, Lucy, out of the entire three, seems the most calm or maybe even the most shy. Really? During these Instagram lives, she would be the quietest. And when she responds to questions, she's not joking around with her sister. She's not making fun. She's just kind of like, hee hee, yeah, oh yeah. Can you tell them apart or? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, I can. Yeah, but they look pretty identical. Oh, I see. Yeah. Now, Caitlin, one of the triplets, was actually one of the 44 finalists in the Canadian branch of the Miss World 2020 pageant. So all the triplets, they did pretty well for themselves. Now, side note, the triplets' mom... Winnie Lee. She is a strong presence in Canada. She's powerful. When Lucy's parents first immigrated from China to Canada, they did not have much in their name. But be that as it may, they go on to create a whole Chinese Canadian empire. Her mom goes by the name Winnie and she runs this financial management business. She manages rich people's money and in return, she makes rich people money. She is described as high profile and powerful. According to Lucy, the main bread and butter of the businesses, her mom would sell these 20 year life insurance policies that would allow Chinese clients from China to transfer funds into Canada without being taxed. Ah, I see. Which I would say, you know, is a little, I don't know if this is true. I don't know how sus it is. I don't know. It just sounds a little crazy when she says it like that. I would say there are pictures of her with Justin Trudeau. There's videos of her shaking hands with Justin Trudeau, the prime minister of Canada. She's hanging out with China's general counsel in Toronto. She's held several fundraisers for Trudeau, allegedly as part of this campaign that was run by Trudeau's political party to seek donations from the wealthy Chinese Canadians. It was a whole thing. They're, wow. Yeah, and they're apparently not your average fundraiser. During one event, there were Cirque du Soleil members performing. I don't even know how big of a space you would need for performers of that caliber. They're not just doing somersaults in the same three foot radius over and over again. So this, these are massive fundraisers. There's videos of Trudeau bringing her flowers. She's translating for him. There's one source that even stated that she went on a trip to China with him, almost like a makeshift ambassador. So Winnie is not a woman who plays around, okay? She is not the type of woman to just let her children do whatever they want. Lucy describes her mom as a tiger mom. Her three girls, the triplets, they had founded Canada Youth Funding Association when they were just 13 years old. They had hopes of uniting all children to learn, grow, and experience. I don't know what they did, but that was the whole selling point. The three triplets, a 13-year-old, founded a... A foundation. I see. Mm Mm-hmm. Lucy even has pictures next to Justin Trudeau at these fundraising events. I mean, her mom encouraged every single one of her kids to study business and even made a deal. She said, the first triplet to get licensed to sell life insurance for my company is going to be rewarded big time. It said every month she would host these little family dinners that feel more like company dinners, which is very reminiscent of LVMH, if you guys want me to talk about them one day. But if one of the family members makes a mistake during that dinner, the whole family has the opportunity to comment on it, just publicly shame them. They can comment on whether or not it's mom's fault for not teaching them better, whether it's dad's fault for not foreseeing such an event, or if it's their fault for knowing not to do something and still doing it anyway. She says the seven of us are like a company board of directors. Each of the seven directors has a voice and can make decisions. Running a business and managing a family are quite similar. So clearly, her kids are doing very well. Winnie would even go on these panels to talk about parenting. During one speech, she is introduced, and this is what the host has to say about Winnie Lee. Every time she appears in public, Winnie, she speaks quickly and decisively, giving the impression of a powerful woman. Nobody would guess that in her personal life, she is the mother of five children. Many people say a successful woman can't have a family. Successful woman can't have kids. So often that now she proactively tells people that she has five children. Then everyone wants to know, what's your secret? Managing a thriving career while raising children. Winnie is clapped onto the stage and she says, Ladies and gentlemen, Good evening. It is my five children that forced me to succeed. 
She says raising children is all about having them try to succeed on their own. She states that when the family was much younger, they would have these family trips planned, yearly family trips, and she would have each of the children plan out the entire trip, handle all the travel arrangements. Even if they saw a mistake in the works, the parents would see something bad was about to happen. They did not interfere. During one trip, she was talking about how she taught the kids to wake up on time. She says, for example, I always hear others say, oh, my child doesn't wake up even after being called so many times in the morning to get up. That does not happen in our family. I told my husband that on a trip, if we have a 6 a.m. flight and our child does not wake up, we will not wake them up. The whole family will not return home instead, and they will have to beg on the streets for food. And they said, mother, that is way too stressful. We will just wake up. They set their alarms and woke up the next morning at 4 a.m. In fact, they knocked on our door and said, mom and dad, if you don't get up now, we're going to miss our flight. It's all about cultivating leadership skills and independent thinking. Her husband says about Winnie, Winnie? Some say my wife is a powerful woman, but I think she is an excellent wife and the best mother. Winnie herself would tell her kids that this is a crucial time in their lives. They need to all grow up and become a powerful, successful woman, just like their mother, aka herself, So since the day that Lucy turned 17, she has been working as a financial advisor for her mom's business, which I don't even trust most financial advisors, period. But a 17 year old financial advisor is crazy, is insane. Like maybe she's just that smart. In 2019, Lucy decides I might just try to figure out if this is what I really want in life. So she asks her mom if she can take some time to figure her life out. Paid, of course, a monthly allowance would be non-negotiable, of course. So that's what happens. For two years, the triplets go on to become Instagram famous. The Mia triplets, where they would model in lingerie or swimsuits together. They would make around $500 to $1,000 per sponsored post, which they said was not really money. It was just fun money. They like doing it more than anything, okay? One of the sponsors even sent her a free blonde wig that she really utilizes. Now, it appears her mom is very supportive, Lucy's mom would even go on to state this about Lucy, how her eldest was admitted into Harvard. Yes, the same one that the attorney called possibly the stupidest person on the planet. Lucy's mom says, when my daughter got admitted there, I found it particularly strange. Her grades were really poor when she was young, but it's about what label you give your children. Our eldest child is now succeeding at Harvard. I was very puzzled. I said, Lucy, why did mom think your grades were always not good when you were so young? Why is it that now at Harvard, a notoriously difficult school, you can get such good grades? She told me, mom, growing up, you always told me that my grades are not good. So I always felt like the dumb one. I would just go to school and just sit there. Whatever. I'm stupid anyway. Why should I study? So I would sneak out and play, you know? And I told myself every day, I'm stupid. My daughter tells me, now this is what I want to tell others. Do not put a label on your children. She says that Lucy has now taken away that label and she wakes up every morning and says, I am smart, I am smart. And as a result, she's been studying, her grades are good, the teachers have responded well, the professors. So I asked children, you are the best, do not label yourself, thank you. That's her speech. She forgets to mention that her daughter Lucy goes to the Harvard Extension Program, which, okay, side note, I think any sort of education is an admirable thing. It does not matter, but it is a bit misleading that she talks about it in such a preachy way. And again, this isn't even a point I would bring up, but she uses it to promote her businesses and to gain more influence in the area. See, look how incredible my children turned out. I'm very credible. It is at least a little bit misleading. Netizens have said about the Harvard Extension Program, quote, it's a bit embarrassing. It's a total waste of money. It looks tacky. It's the equivalent to taking one online continuing education class at Harvard and then listing it on your resume. Another one writes, I'm a recruiter and 100% it does not hold the same weight as Harvard. It's the equivalent of having a degree from Grand Canyon University because almost anyone can get in as long as you pay for it. Again, any education is good education, but the way she's presenting it is goofy, okay? A lot of netizens point to the fact that there are actually really, really good extension programs out there. I think Georgia Tech has a good one. MIT has a good one. And they say that really people only choose the Harvard Extension School so that they can say Harvard. Like no other reason, really. It's not the best program out there, especially for the amount of money it costs. They say it just doesn't look great. 
So in this context, it does feel a little bit misleading, but fine. The messaging at the entire speech is do not label your children. That's it, which is a good message. But the courts have already labeled Lucy as a killer. Lucy is brought into a small windowless room in Canada, the interrogation room, and she makes herself comfortable. I don't know if she asked for it. I don't know if they gave it to her, but you see her walk in. She's pretty smiley and she's draping a police issued blanket over her. Kind of like how I draped my scarf over me today. That's how the blanket is over her, but it's a full size blanket. What do you I, mean police issued? It has like police on there? No, but it looks like they're handing it to her. Uh, uh, I don't think they would let her just wear that. Ah, so I she's see. draping it over herself. I feel like her energy is more on par with the demeanor of me going downstairs to watch Twilight. It's just very strange. And she just plops onto one of the chairs and she starts off by saying, I feel really rude and um, I don't want to like um, not seem like I'm don't want to cooperate and if it was up to me I would just tell you guys everything but my lawyer and my mom strongly instructed me not to say anything and they said that they're um, on my defense while you guys are not on my defense so I don't know I just feel like I shouldn't say anything until I speak with them on Wednesday I think they said that they're gonna come see me on Wednesday how old is she at that point? 25. Oh, okay. But she does ask the officer something along the lines of, but how do you decide who to believe? <laughs> <laughs> like, aka, do I, should I believe you guys? Or yeah. should I believe my mom and lawyers? Yes, but also like, why don't you guys believe me? Like, are you guys going to believe me if I tell you something? <laughs> it's uh. just so bizarre. This is where it all starts unraveling and Lucy is going to come full circle. December 9th, 2021, a man named Chin gets arrested for a first degree murder for a murder that happened a few months ago. And Chin is so confused. Why is he being arrested? The police show him the picture of the victims and he's even more confused now. He's like, I have never seen these people in my life, let alone murdered them. I don't know these people. I have no connection with these people. What are you talking about? I couldn't even point these people out on the street if you asked me to. The police don't believe him. They know he was there that day, okay? Months ago, a couple was found shot dead in a parking lot of a warehouse. The police were called to the scene where they found a man deceased on the floor with at least six gunshot wounds. Next to him was an airline ticket in his name and a torn $5 Canadian bill. On the other side of the parking lot was a single Christian Louboutin thigh-high boot. The deceased man's name is Tyler and his girlfriend Jordan had been rushed to the hospital, but things weren't looking good. She had been shot in the heart. When the police start chasing all the possible leads, they find that a number was in the exact location as the couple during the shooting. Chins. The cell records show that he was there. He was there the day that they were killed. And Chin is arguing with the police. There was no way he was there that day. I mean, prove it. They whip out his cell records. He was in fact there. This is when Chin starts sharing this very wild story of how he has a friend named, I have a friend named Oliver. Chin argues that he's known Oliver for what, like 10 years now? They worked at the same restaurant before they were friends. And when friends ask for weird favors, you do it. You don't ask questions. You just kind of do it. The odd favor that was asked of Chin is he needs to swap his SIM card with Oliver's wife, Lucy. Lucy said her family tracks each other's locations on her phone and they have this very important meeting and she didn't want her family to know about it. So she has to leave her phone at home, but without a phone, she can't really call in case of emergencies. So he needs to swap SIM cards with her. It's a huge ask. And the police are thinking, really now? I mean, this is very dumb, but Chen is passionately telling them, yes, it's weird, but he agreed to it because Lucy's family is rich and rich people do weird things. I mean, what's the worst that could have happened? Chen believed that Lucy would not do anything weird. Then he gets arrested for murder a few months later. He said later that night, he met back up with them and swapped SIM cards again. Nothing seemed alarming. He would have never known that someone had died that night. When Oliver and Lucy are both finally arrested in Hungary, in Eastern Europe, Lucy responds, oh, the SIM cards and all of that. I have a perfectly reasonable answer to what I thought was going on. Suddenly, she's ready to talk. Lucy says she doesn't even know what they were doing at the warehouse that day. No clue why they were meeting these people. They're friends of Oliver's. Tyler and his pregnant girlfriend, Jordan, were there. They're not really her friends. So she wasn't that curious why they were at the back of this random warehouse. 
Lucy was with Oliver in their Audi Q5. The other couple, Tyler and Jordan, arrived in their Range Rover and they, all of them, all four of them walked out to the back door of the facility and it was locked because of course it was locked and they don't have the key. So it's a moment of confusion. But since it's February in Canada, Jordan says she's really cold. She's pregnant. She's going to get into a Range Rover and turn the heat on. Lucy joins her in the car. She gets into the Range Rover and the two of them are just sitting there. And Jordan asks her, hey, Lucy, where's your realtor? Lucy was like, I was so confused. Like, what do you mean my realtor? My realtor's not coming. Why would my realtor be coming here? Wait, what's going on? Lucy says she gets out the car to ask Oliver what the hell is going on because she thinks her husband is lying about something again. But when she walks up to him, Tyler is screaming at Oliver, demanding, where's the realtor? Where's your realtor? Oliver tells Lucy to check around the property to see if there's a lockbox. Lucy's confused, but she starts walking away. She says she's about a football field away and around the corner when she hears these pop pop noises. She doesn't realize what kind of pops they are. And she goes back to investigate because it was kind of loud and she sees Tyler on the ground, but she's not wearing her glasses. So she doesn't know why he's on the ground. She just thought like, that's weird. Yeah. And Oliver screams at her to get into the Audi. She's about to get in when she sees Jordan in the front seat of the Range Rover trying to back up, reversing straight into the building. It's chaotic. And Lucy freezes because she's, wait, it looks like Jordan is looking for something in the car. I don't know what she's looking for. Finally, after what feels like forever, she snaps out of it and realizes that Oliver is screaming at her. You're everything up. Listen to me. Get in the car. She finally jumps into the Audi. And that's about it. It's just very traumatizing. Wait, I mean, wait, wait, wait. Jordan was backing up a car? In the Range Rover. Okay, and then what happened? And then they just like drove off in the Audi. And then she just thought it was weird. And she thinks later Oliver went back. I don't know. She's saying it was just weird. It was traumatizing. Her belief in that moment was that Oliver had run Tyler over, probably by accident. Oliver kept bossing her around, telling her that she needs to take the stairs up to their apartment now and not take the elevator because of the cameras. But she's so exhausted and she's terrified. They also live on the 34th floor. She remembers, yeah, so she's like, I'm not doing that. She says she just remembers squatting down in the middle of the stairwell, sobbing because she's so confused and scared and traumatized. And like, why is she walking up 34 flights of stairs? That night, Lucy says there was no way she could fall asleep. It was just a lot. She checks the clock. It's 2 a.m. And she gets on her phone and she reads an article about a shooting that said a man and a woman were shot. That was the first moment she realized that someone was injured and she didn't even know it was a shooting until now. She shakes Oliver up, shoves the article in his face and she keeps asking Oliver what happened, what happened. She says, he said it was him or me. He's saying he saved my life because they wanted to kill us. He's saying Tyler's gang are going to come after us. In fact, Oliver tells her that he basically just saved both of them. So now they got to go. They got to leave. So they got to go on the run. It's not safe here. Tyler's gang is going to come after them now. Hurry, we got to go. They leave the apartment. They drive in her Mercedes. They have no plan. They barely have time to pack anything. She leaves empty handed. He stuffs a backpack with their passports and about $17,000 in cash. Other than that, nothing. They drive until they run out of gas. They end up at the general store. They toss everything in that restroom. They leave the Mercedes in the parking lot nearby, like a nearby little side parking lot. And then they take a taxi back to Toronto. From there, they take a train to Montreal, but they're running late. So the taxi driver is like, I'll just take you there to the airport. They pay $400 in cash. Then they board a flight directly to Europe. First, they land in Germany. Then they catch a connecting flight to the Czech Republic where they meet up with a guy named Martin. This is what Lucy's saying. She's like, I don't... No, Martin. Lucy's never met this guy in her life. This is supposedly one of Oliver's European business partners, but that means nothing to her right now. She said she was just so scared out of her mind at this point. She even told her mom and sisters to leave at the house in the middle of the night. Just leave your things. Go, go, go. She was terrified that Tyler's gang was going to come after her family and everybody that they love. She's telling her family to flee? Yes. Because the gang is very dangerous, she said. Now, side note, because some reports state that while she's basically a fugitive running from the law in Eastern Europe, her family members are sending her hundreds of thousands of dollars. So they must believe her story. Now, regardless, they spend a few nights in the country before traveling to Slovakia. Oliver's dad picks him up from the airport. And that night, she remembers waking up in the middle of the night from frantic calls from her sisters saying, there's arrest warrants out for you and Oliver. 
Lucy and Oliver wake up Oliver's dad, who tells them, you need to leave. This is the first place they will be looking for you. You need to go. Lucy does just that. I mean, she's terrified. She said, I'm just in shock at this point. I never thought I'd be charged with a crime. She keeps asking Oliver what the hell happened because it's just not adding up, but he refuses to respond. He just keeps saying self-defense. It was me or him. They get into Oliver's dad's work truck. Lucy's Chinese. They're in Slovakia. She sticks out like a sore thumb. So she's hiding in the back truck. I mean, they basically have to hide away in an apartment that belongs to Oliver's dad's friend. She said she called her mom right away and her mom is hysterical screaming and Lucy is hysterically crying into the phone. Lucy's mom is demanding Lucy come home right away. They can talk to some lawyers about talking to the police and explain everything that happened. But of course, that's not a plan that Oliver liked. That's what Lucy says. He refused. He did not want to turn himself in. It's not even an option here. Lucy's mom, they're still in Canada. Yes. They did not flee the country. No. They're like, you need to come here and you can explain this to the police. The next morning, she wakes up to Oliver speaking to these two guys. Who are they? She's told that they're part of Europol police, European Interpol, basically. And they have cars with diplomatic plates. We're Paul and Milo. She said those were their names. Lucy couldn't understand a single thing they were saying, but Oliver was translating for her. And Oliver is telling her, you think Tyler being dead means we're safe? No, you don't even know how dangerous this guy is. My dad had to get the European police to get involved. That costs just over a quarter million dollars. And we might need to transfer more money. They're trying to save us. They're going to help us not get caught because they understand how corrupt the Canadian justice system is. So we're going to stay with Paul and Milo in his apartment. Now, on a few conditions, we don't get to have access to our phones. We will get fake passports, which is the only way we can travel now. And we will only be driven around in these military looking vehicles with diplomatic tags. And they're going to drive us into a safe house in Hungary. And uh, that's where we're going to be. This is how they live for the next two months. It's not until May 15th. Lucy says she gets her phone back and discovers that the international warrant against them is gone. She doesn't see anything else about it now, which means she can go apply for a Canadian passport so she can go back to Canada. The Canadian authorities, unbeknownst to her, are already waiting in Budapest for her. They've been tracking her through Interpol, and now she's just revealed herself. The two are arrested immediately outside of a church, but they weren't actually going to church. It's like a busy street in Budapest that's known for their wild nightlife, so they were likely going out for the night. And Lucy Mm. decides to immediately head back to Canada with authorities. She's like, my mom can send us a private jet. And they're like, no, we're going to fly economy. And she's like, oh my God, I've never flied economy. She's like, I only fly first or private, basically, is what she said. Maybe not verbatim, don't sue me, but the gist. (laughs) Yeah, the gist. The priorities. Yeah. So she goes back to Canada with authorities while Oliver decides to stay and tries to fight extradition. This is the story of how Canada's most politically well-connected family's daughter ends up as an international fugitive. I mean, it's just wild. So one of the more annoying parts of all of this is Lucy states in her whole version, first version, is that she wasn't even supposed to be there that night. She had dinner planned at her mom's house, but she only agreed to go with Oliver to that stupid warehouse because he asked her to drive her that night and Oliver told her to do this weird thing, very weird thing, and she just went with it, which was to switch SIM cards with a friend of his named Chen. You know, so she kept her device. But if you called Lucy that night, It would ring in her apartment on Chen's phone. And if you called Chen, it would ring on Lucy's phone. Lucy thought it was strange, but she didn't think it was strange enough to question it further. Or I don't know, not do it at all. So she swaps SIM cards with him and Oliver fully leaves his phone at the apartment and they leave. I mean, to be honest, she mainly went with him after their fight because she wanted to make sure that Oliver wasn't going to cheat on her. That's why she ended up at that warehouse. It's kind of an unbelievable story, right? Maybe, perhaps. I mean, a few things definitely don't add up with what the police found at the crime scene. A lot of things don't add up at all. And some parts of the story just don't make any sense. It's just nonsensical. But who's going to argue her story? Both victims have been shot. Oliver's not opening up. In fact, he's fighting with every random excuse in the book to not leave Eastern Europe. And it's just Lucy, the credible daughter of a wealthy business tycoon in Canada who has millions of dollars at their disposal to hire the best defense. Who's going to tell them that this story isn't true? Regardless, the truth of the matter is Tyler was shot six times. He was murdered. Jordan was shot three times. Only one bullet hit her, but it went into her heart. She was supposed to die that day, but she didn't. 
After spending three days in a coma and a bullet taken out of her chest, Jordan wakes up. And she's got a lot to say, mainly that Lucy is a big phony liar. She states that she remembers everything that happened that night very clearly. Three days ago, February 28th, 2021, Jordan remembers showing up to the warehouse with her boyfriend, Tyler. They, Tyler and Jordan, were going to meet with this couple, Oliver and Lucy, where they were going to see if this warehouse was a good fit for a business opportunity to rent it and use it as a marijuana growing operation. But when they get there, the realtor isn't there and all the doors are locked, which is very annoying. They have to wait for the realtor now in the cold. Tyler and Jordan get into the Range Rover to wait. They turn on the heat. Jordan is in the passenger side. Tyler, her boyfriend, is on the driver's side, turns on the car for her. And then he waves over Lucy and is like, hey, come sit down. It's cold. So Lucy slides into the driver's side. Jordan says Lucy won't even look at her. She's just on her phone. She's texting, but she's acting very nervous. It's like the lack of eye contact is a little bit strange. It's not even like she's distracted or just bored. It's like she can't even look at her. Jordan tries to make some light talk. How's your weekend? Good, fine. What did you do? Nothing we drink on Thursday. Then Lucy just states, oh my God, you're dressed so pretty and I'm dressed like a bum. Which, you know, now that she says it, it is weird. Jordan is thinking Lucy told them that they have dinner reservations after this warehouse for four at this fancy restaurant. So yeah, now that she brings it up, she is severely underdressed for that. But Jordan is polite. She doesn't say anything. Jordan just says, but when she comes into the car, she just can't look at me, which I thought was strange. Eventually, she gets out of the car and now my car turned off because the driver's side door had closed. So I guess the car thought it was off Mm -hmm. or that everybody had left. So she slides. She doesn't exit the car. She just slides over from the passenger seat to the driver's seat Mm -hmm. while being inside and turns the car back on. She said that's when she looks up at the side and at the passenger side window where she had just been sitting, Oliver is standing there, glaring at her, pointing a gun at her. And she said, I couldn't move. I couldn't talk. My mouth was wide open. He's pointing a gun at me. He was shaking and his eyes were bulging. And then he says, get out of here, Joe. But I guess he doesn't give her the chance to do that because the last thing she remembers is gunshots going off. Jordan said she heard Tyler's last words and Tyler had said, Oliver, what the f- bro? So Oliver had shot Tyler. Jordan's first instinct is to put the car in reverse to try and get out of there. But as she's flooring it, she hears multiple gunshots additionally go off. She had been shot. The car slams into the warehouse, reverses. There are clear holes in her memory from the trauma, but she does remember seeing Oliver dragging her out of the car and throwing her onto the cold floor. And they both drove off. They drove off in the Audi and the Range Rover. That was Jordan and Tyler's car. And then she just remembers crawling on the road on her hands and knees, asking for anyone. Is there anyone to save her? She's still conscious. Yes. And she had been shot literally in the chest. Yeah. And she says it took an hour. And then finally, she just heard a woman and her voice kept saying, hang in there, sweetie, hang in there. That woman was Annette Bright. The woman had been driving down the road with her boyfriend when she saw what looked like a mangled animal on the side of the road with blood. She just kept driving, but something in her told her, just you turn. If it's an animal, fine. You can call animal control. If it's something else, it it just would keep her up at night. Mm -hmm. So she U-turned, and what do you know? It's not an animal. It's a woman on the road crawling. She parks the car, lunges out. What happened? What's wrong? And she just keeps saying, help me, please. I've been shot. She could see Jordan is getting paler by the second. Annette's boyfriend is already calling 911. The woman on the floor keeps talking, but the only thing Annette could understand is, help me, help me. And then she faded out into a coma that doctors were feeling very pessimistic about that she would never wake up again. The worst part of Jordan's story is that while she was crawling down the long driveway of the warehouse to get help, she could see her Range Rover driving back and forth on the main road with her attempted killers scanning, hunting. So it's presumed that they came back and she was gone. Jordan is gone. So they're like, how is she gone? We shot her. How is she not dead? So I think she had crawled into the bushes and she just remembers seeing them driving around looking for her, practically hunting her. She's also said that she could hear them fighting and arguing. She could hear one of them saying that, no, for sure she's dead. And the other one said, well, we just need to make sure. Wow. 
After about an hour, they leave without finding Jordan. And that is how she's able to get help. Which, who is Jordan? And why would someone even want her dead? Why would someone kill her boyfriend, the father of her unborn child, Tyler? Tyler can make up to a million dollars a day running what seems to be a cocaine empire. I mean, I don't know if empire is the right word, but a million a day, that's not a side job. That's corporate monopoly level money. Jordan says Tyler was not a quote street level dealer. He would help import cocaine into Canada and sold it to other dealers. So he's at the top of the food chain, if you will. But she says they weren't in as dangerous of a position as the street level dealers because one of them had been killed once, but Tyler doesn't really have enemies. He's just overseeing and profiting and helping smuggle in the cocaine. Side note, a quick disclaimer, Tyler is a murder victim and absolutely nobody should be murdered. I think that much is very clear, but it would be a bit strange for me to not address the fact that his occupation is likely indirectly harming a lot of people. So it's just very tricky. Now, Tyler was trying to get out of this underworld business. He keeps trying to use his funds to create legitimate, hopefully tax paying businesses, a diamond company called Hard as Diamonds, as well as a wellness weight loss supplement brand called Elite Organic Nutrition. Jordan would say he just wanted out of the cocaine life. We wanted to have a family and be normal and escape that negativity. He just wanted to be a more legitimate businessman, especially since he has three children that are growing older. And Jordan, his longtime girlfriend, the one who was shot, is pregnant with his fourth child. She's 14 weeks pregnant. So a more legitimate business would provide a sense of security for everybody. Now, Tyler and Jordan have a friend who introduced them to a guy named Oliver Knox, this rich kid with rich parents. But he, his parents are also very powerfully well connected in Europe was the story that they were told. And he has all these businesses that integrate European contacts with Canadian contacts. And this is during the pandemic. So Oliver's new business plan is they know people in Europe who sell hospital gowns, syringes and face masks, mark up the price by a shit ton. That's how they describe it, since hospitals need it right now, and it's just printing money in Europe. They're just printing money. They have a factory in Europe that makes it, then they sell it to the European hospitals. Mm -hmm. And they're looking for investors. Like a, okay, medical... Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Tyler and Jordan invest at first $170,000, which is a lot. But eventually, in total, they invest about $500,000. Crazy. Now, Jordan says, we were expecting millions in dollars of profit. After our initial investment, we put in the 170, then another 300 to get more trucks so the money would come in faster. We wanted to roll the money, which looked very feasible. Their share of the profits would be close to $3 million. Now, this is the part that they're struggling with, is bringing that money in from Europe to Canada without raising a bunch of red flags. Because once you bring that kind of money in, first of all, it's difficult to transfer that amount. But secondly, once you bring that into Canada, it's going to be heavily taxed. And third, once they tax it, they might be like, how'd you get this money? You explain, oh, I invested in this mass business. How much did you invest? Half a million. How did you even get half a million dollars when your tax returns show that you don't make any money because they're not making legitimate income? It's not an easy transfer. So the day of the shooting, the couple were going to meet Oliver and Lucy at the warehouse and Oliver had this new business plan, find a warehouse. Lucy would be perfect. Her mom has lots of connections and they own lots of warehouses and they have powerful realtors. I can get them a good deal. Then they start a legal marijuana growing operation. And from there, I'm sure that Tyler can get more of his money out. Maybe he'll get more of the profits of that. And Oliver and Lucy will take the European profits because it's easier for them to get the money in Canada. You know, that's why they showed up to this empty, abandoned warehouse in the middle of this industrial street. But the problem is Oliver has no plans to pay the couple back, let alone give them a share of their profits. In fact, Oliver Knox is not Oliver Knox. His name is Oliver Carafa, and he's already killed someone before. What? Oliver tells lots of lies. The first about being the mask business. It's unclear whether or not Oliver himself is in the mask business or if the entire thing is also a lie. But one thing is for sure. He's not giving Tyler his money back. He starts making up all these excuses on why they can't get the money back. And every question Tyler has, there's a long winded explanation, long winded excuse. Even the meetup at the warehouse, not real. To lure Tyler and Jordan out where Oliver shoots them both and goes on the run with his wife, Lucy. They flee the scene within 48 hours there in Europe on the run as international fugitives. They are not located for three months. 
when Lucy finally comes back home, Oliver does not. Yeah. When they're both arrested in Hungary, Lucy comes back immediately. She does have to fly commercial, but nevertheless, she comes back to Canada. Oliver does something fascinating. He files a petition with the courts in Hungary, stating that if he goes back to Canada, because the Toronto police are so corrupt, there will be no way he will get a fair trial. They would do something shady. He argues to Hungary, his life is on the line. Oliver Carafa has no plans on going back. He even hires PIs to look into Tyler Pratt to show the Hungarians like, hey, look, there's a lot of drug dealing going on in Canada and they're going to kill me. The gangs are going to kill me in the prison. You don't know the prisons in Canada. Yeah, he says, because of his extensive criminal connections and his associates want to avenge his death, my life is in danger. He alleges he will never get a fair trial. Hungarian authorities relay back. Criminal relationships are not bound by national borders, which means that the accused would not be safe in practically any country in the world. The court therefore establishes correctly and lawfully that the conditions of the extradition have been met and orders the arrest for surrender of the accused. AKA, he's going to get extradited. But then he tries to stop that. And he's like, Slovakia, my home country, can you please try and help me? But that doesn't work either. Eight months later, he sit in economy with Canadian officials. It's likely that his whole plan to stay in Europe was not because he truly believed the Canadian justice system is corrupt. I mean, how could he? He like got five years for killing someone before. We're going to get there. But allegedly, it's been said that he believes Hungary would have been an easier place to bribe corrupt officials. And Canada is harder. Mm. Lucy did not care. She did not like the prisons there. Her mom does a press release when she's back to Canada. And her press release is the family is shocked, disturbed, and puzzled by Lucy's involvement in the tragic incident. They state that they are sure that Lucy would not be involved in such an incident voluntarily and would not do such a ridiculous thing. They say, we can hardly imagine the shock and anxiety Lucy experienced after the incident. They beg Lucy to cooperate with the authorities. Which, yes. So Oliver killed Tyler because of money? Yes. But Lucy is rich? Yes. That's also her defense. So now we're trying to figure out what's going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is she involved? Is she not involved? Right? Now, side note, Lucy talks about her time in a Hungarian prison while waiting to be extradited. She said every single day she was only given five slices of bread and five cigarettes. No other food. She said everything cost money there, even sanitary products, and she didn't have money to be put into her account. Now, I don't know how Canadian jails compare, but she's not someone that's going to withstand any sort of prison because she does make Canadian bail somehow. The bail conditions are probably the most rigorous I've seen. The conditions are this. Lucy will be allowed on bail for $2.7 million. Her bail is paid out $2 million by her mom. $200,000 $200,000 by her friend and another $500,000 by another second friend. Now, I thought that was weird because first of all, that is very crazy for a friend to put up that kind of money. Now, another thing is, why wouldn't her mom just pay it all if they're so wealthy? There's yeah. a reason because under the rigorous bail agreement, Lucy has to be under watch 24 seven by whoever has participated in putting up her bail. They practically become her guardians. If she has to go to the doctor's appointment, it has to be with one of her three guardians. She cannot have friends over, but she can have her three guardians over. Wow. She cannot go to social engagements, but she can stay with her guardians 24 seven and hang out with them. So it's likely her mom didn't want to babysit her the whole time and Lucy wants to be with her friends. One of them even moved into the family home to, quote, watch over Lucy. In addition to those rules, Lucy has to wear a GPS tracker at all times. She cannot have any visitors in the house other than immediate family. She can leave her house for exercise with her ankle monitor on, but she can only go within a one mile radius of the house at all times and only for up to an hour per day. The only time she can go further from a mile is when she has a court approved medical appointment or to see her attorneys. That is it. She cannot even use the cell phone. She cannot use the internet without supervision from one of her guardians. And lastly, she cannot apply for a new passport, which honestly doesn't sound so bad when you're quarantining in your parents' likely multi-million dollar estate with your two besties, but she still breaks bail. Because (laughs) before the trial starts, it stated that she went to a party. She was rearrested and then re-released on bail again. But With she, her ankle monitor, she went to a party? Yeah. Wow. 
The trial is going to be a joint trial with both Oliver and Lucy on trial for murder and attempted murder. And so there's three arguments, one from Lucy and her team, one from Oliver and one from the prosecutors and Jordan. Now, Lucy gets a high profile defense attorney. The Oliver's defense attorney, he's a really good defense attorney, allegedly for getting drug dealers off but not for murder. So it seems like he's way less high profile Mm -hmm. and Lucy's family did not pay for his attorney or anything. So there's a lot of speculations by netizens that if they had the same attorney and had they stuck with the same story, they might have gotten less time. Yeah, so you got the three stories from the prosecutor and Jordan and then the two other lovebirds that are no longer lovebirds, it seems. Now, Lucy's story changes multiple times, which is not the best look. The first time she shares her version of events, she states that a random stranger, a third party, showed up and shot the couple. It was crazy. It was probably one of Tyler's enemies. Then she later changes the story to say that, no, 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 you're right. Oliver was the shooter. But I had no idea that it was going to happen. I thought he like ran Tyler over. It was crazy. And then she says that she was forced to write the initial confession that an unknown man had shot the couple by Oliver, by her husband. He was like, you better write this. She states about her husband, you know, his business wasn't going as planned. He decided it would be best to kill Jordan and Tyler before they found out and tried to kill him or someone he loved instead. Sort of like a pre-planned self-defense that she had no idea about, which also just like pre-planned self-defense is the most unhinged defense. I don't know. She said by that point, he had told her all of that. She didn't even know that Tyler had invested in Oliver's PPE mask business. She said she knew nothing about Tyler and Jordan. In fact, she would never want to do business with them because they're not, quote, presentable people. She claims Tyler is very, very terrifying. He was not happy that he's not getting his money back. She said Tyler was violent with Oliver, punching and abusing him. He would allegedly threaten him. If you want to turn me into the police, I have friends in the police. Before I even get booked within 48 hours, I'll have the Somalians kill everyone you love. (sighs) During the initial interrogation, she's asked, so right off the bat, you're not impressed by Tyler. Right off the bat, I say do not associate with these people because they're not good for our social image and um, because she's a known Hamilton stripper and um, Tyler is known in Vancouver as like a scary gang member according to some mutual friends that I knew. This is during interrogation? Yes. Furthermore, she states that Tyler had this big business idea that he was trying to rope them into, which they would bring girls in from the Czech Republic to Toronto and Vancouver to get into the escorting business, which for lack of a better words, she believes sounds precisely like human trafficking. Now, we don't know if this conversation even ever took place, but that is her claim. She said that she would even get into fights with Oliver about how much she doesn't like this couple. She said, I really didn't want Oliver to be associated with them. He knew my opinion and started not telling me when he was going to meet with them. He would downplay their communications. She further alleges that Tyler and Jordan have ties to the Wolf Pack, which is a big gang in the area. And when everything went down, she felt like it was an I told you so moment. She testifies later during the trial. Tyler is very, very scary and a very aggressive. He scared me. He's a very big man and very scary. I'm so sorry. What is a I told you so moment? The murder? <laughs> yeah, like telling Oliver I told you not to interact with these types of people. Yeah. Like this will happen if you keep like, yeah, murder is going to happen. It's just like what her energy throughout all of this is on par with someone maybe getting into an argument. She's with so people. detached from the real world. Is the yes. feeling. She <laughs> she, feels like maybe she growing up, she has never faced any consequences. Yeah. So her attitude is literally this lighthearted. And I think the way she speaks about all these things that happened, it's almost this very firm. I don't know where it comes from belief that everyone's just going to believe her and be on her side. Mm. Right. Like everyone's on her side. I, I told them, don't you agree? It's kind of that attitude is the vibe. Wow. And the prosecutors are not on her side. They ask her on the stand, you've been telling us how dangerous you thought it was being around Tyler and his gang connections, his drug dealing. But given that fear, you invited him into your family home? Well, it's not as high risk as being seen with them in public. She thought seeing Tyler and Jordan was worth the risk if the business would turn out well for Oliver. But now in hindsight, she says, quote, I guess I made a mistake. The prosecutors ask her three days before the murder of Tyler Pratt and attempted murder of Jordan Romano. You were part of a plan to kill them, weren't you? No, I was not. What you are saying is ridiculous. 
it's hard to imagine doing something more despicable to a pregnant woman, correct? Correct. You lied to her face, correct? Correct. The prosecutors tell her, the only pattern that has emerged is your ability to lie and deceive and be dishonest. This was a carefully planned murder. Not correct. She states, these people were dangerous. They were trying to kill us or something like that. I agree that there was a murder plan, but I don't agree that I was part of this plan. You don't have a moral compass. Incorrect. I think my moral compass is not right, but I'm not okay with breaking the law and committing crimes. And most importantly, I would never be okay with a plan to commit murder. Her attorney argues the motive for the murder at the end was money, but her attorney argues Lucy did not need money. She comes from a rich family. This is Oliver's problem. This is not Lucy's issue, which is just another way to say your client is broke and mine is not. But does it actually prove anything? She also states about the PPE business, the mask making factory in Europe during the interrogation. I have no idea about any of that because Oliver and my relationship, he deals with the finances and the business and he doesn't really... I mean, he tells me the gist of things, but he never really tells me the figures, what he's doing. And it's always been like that since me and Oliver's been dating. We've been together almost three years, but we knew each other since high school. She also argues that she does not have the best relationship with Oliver. Honestly, it was toxic. She says, I mean, I was practically his chauffeur. How long they've been married? At this point, about a year, a year and some change. The way they got married (sighs) the way they get married okay so 2020 the pandemic hits two months after everyone the whole world goes into lockdown eastern europe is in lockdown they're like you know what i don't like being at home let's go to europe and have some fun so they're trying to fly into europe and europe is like no we are not accepting anyone who does not have a reason to be in europe however oliver can go because he's a dual citizen he's slovakian and canadian citizenship right Uh but lucy is just canadian citizenship so they say i mean the only way that you'd be able to get into europe right now is if you guys were married then because he can go he can bring his wife obviously So in the airport, they apply for a marriage license. They get a Zoom call with an officiant, get married so they can board their flight to a fun European trip while everybody else is fighting for their lives and people are dying. That is wild. Yeah. Lucy is also asked why she wore a blonde wig on the way to commit murder. I mean, this was very clearly an attempt to conceal her identity in the elevator to throw investigators off because she swapped her SIM card to make the SIM card look like she was at home. Then the elevator footage does not show Lucy going down to the parking lot. It shows a blonde woman going down to the parking lot. So she could argue, what do you mean? You don't see me leaving the apartment. My phone records are in the apartment. I was in the apartment the whole time. That's what the prosecution's arguing. And Lucy is like, that is ridiculous. The truth is the wig was from a brand deal that she got on Instagram. So this company sent her a blonde wig and she would wear it while she had intimate relations with Oliver at times. But she got into this huge fight with Oliver the day of the shooting because she felt like Oliver was always cheating on her. And when she had seen it out and about, not tucked away, not packed, when she saw it out and about, she just assumed that he was going to bring this wig to go cheat on her and have another woman wear the wig because he's got like a fetish for these wigs, is what she's claiming. So she's like whipping the wig around, asking him what the hell, but he argues with her like, she's always crazy. You're always making up stuff. She loses it, completely loses her marbles, throws on the blonde wig. She's like, yeah, you like blondes? I don't know. Okay. But she like puts it on. So I'm assuming that's what she's claiming her energy is and leaves kind of like, oh yeah, how's this? Is she leaving by herself? Yeah. Oliver takes the stairs down 35 flights, 34 flights. How did she explain his behavior walking 34 flights? She said, I don't know. He's weird. Everything is like. I don't know what he's doing. I don't know anything about him. He's weird. So when she's walking into the elevator, you saw the footage, yes. right? Like, was she hiding? Can you see her face? Or You was cannot it- see her face. She's wearing the blonde wig. She has a hood pulled over her head. She's on her phone and she's, it's just weird. Like, like she's like hiding her face, right? Yes. And I imagine if I were ever in this bizarre, likely untrue situation where we got into a fight and I wore a blonde wig into the elevator, I would snatch it right off when I got in there because I'm angry. I'm like huffing and puffing, but she's just like, her body is tight. Her arms are close to her chest. Yeah. And she's just standing there in the corner looking down. Wow. 
She said that she was expecting him to chase her into the elevator, but he did not. That's the story that she's trying to sell. Yeah. I mean, later she changes the story and she's like, okay, fine. I put on the blonde wig because Oliver told me to do. And I just did what he told me to do. Yeah. And you're saying all of this is under the guidance of the famous attorney? Yes. So there is an allegation or rumors out there by netizens Uh that sometimes rich clients are the worst Uh because they never listen to you. They Ah. think they're smarter than you. Mm. She should have just not said anything. I see. Likely. Yeah. I have a feeling she wasn't listening to her attorney's advice. Yeah, because she was asking, like, who should I trust? Yes. And then even, My attorney told me not to talk to you, but I'm here telling you what they told me not to say. And she just, yeah, she would always, like, stop herself and then be asked a question. And then she would kind of talk and then stop herself. Yeah. Wow. Even all the different houses they stayed in Europe, in Eastern Europe, she said she thought that these were all police who were helping hide them because, I mean, it's like she's on some sort of crime thriller series getting moved around from safe house to safe house in a global network of safe houses to shield her from, I don't know what. It's a very odd story that she's selling. And Lucy does try to make up for all of it by stating, yeah, maybe I'm just dumb. Yeah. Her attorney continues, Lucy is one of the many victims in this case, betrayed by her husband, Oliver. Oliver is the type of guy that takes her to a murder, takes his wife to a murder, a murder he knew obviously he was going to commit. Lucy finally developed a bit of a backbone after spending years being Oliver's doormat. Oliver has had far too many victims in his life, including among the many victims is Lucy. I ask you not to let him take one more down. Oliver's attorney has a different strategy. While Lucy can blame everything on Oliver since he was the one that pulled the trigger, Oliver's defense has to be a bit more creative. They say, we do not dispute in any way that he pulled the trigger on the gun that shot Tyler Pratt and Jordan Romano, aka he did shoot them. He killed Tyler, but the defense attorney argues this is not first degree murder. What Oliver did should be considered second degree murder. He just wanted to, quote, tame a violent, angry, volatile, muscular, international drug dealer. He argued that Tyler had threatened to break his legs if he didn't get his money back and more ASAP. And their whole defense relies on the fact that Tyler is this big, big, scary guy. And Oliver was too dumb and too scared. So he killed him. They say the shooting is so poorly orchestrated. It doesn't meet the threshold for first degree murder. The defense attorney basically states, riddle me this. If what seems at first glance to be a plan so badly thought out that it falls apart because so many obvious things were not considered, that indicates there was no plan to begin with. The attorney argues that one of Tyler's close acquaintances had recently been gunned down in Vancouver. They also state that Jordan and Tyler had gotten into an explosive fight five months into their relationship, where the attorney alleges that Jordan allegedly told others that Tyler had physically harmed her. So they're just trying to paint the victims in this horrible light the whole time. They say, and Jordan even said, Oliver told her, get out of here, Joe, moments before shooting her. So clearly he didn't want to shoot her. It's just these attorneys are doing weird stuff. And why? Instead of killing them right away, why would they wait 30 minutes? Why would they spend 30 minutes with them at the warehouse before the shooting? His attorney states about his wife and her defense team. You know, throughout this trial, Lucy and her team have attempted to do everything they can to demonize Oliver in your eyes to make you hate him. It has been relentless to which Lucy's attorneys have stated. Yeah, he does not need any help in that department. All of his attorneys asked Lucy why she didn't just tell this version of events when she had that interrogation with the authorities. And they say, here's why you didn't, Lucy. You wanted some time to make up a story. It's taken you three years to make up a story. Because the trial happened three years later. Mm -hmm. But if it is true, let's entertain the idea that Lucy's newest version of events is true. Oliver's defense wonders, why would she stay with Oliver in Europe throughout all of this then? The state argues there's no way you can look at this and see something other than a more planned murder. The plan isn't smart. No one said you have to be a smart killer, but you are a killer at the end of the day. This is an outright execution. They swapped SIM cards. They wore a wig. They took the stairs to make it seem like they never left their apartment. They actually purchased a new car. The Audi Q5 was purchased a week before and they didn't change the license plates. So when they found the Audi Q5 later, the authorities, Mm -hmm. it got traced back to the original owner. And they were like, you are doing something suspicious. And she's like, no, 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 I just sold the car. Then they tried to sell the Audi 
but they didn't, along with the Range Rover. And once they realized that Jordan is still alive, they fled the country. Just to add to their cruelty, they state that Lucy and Oliver stole $20,000 in cash after killing them as well. So from the crime scene, they took $20,000 from Tyler's car. Additionally, it's very clear that Tyler wanted his money back, but not in an aggressive way. They state that Tyler was having cash flow problems because a cocaine shipment was seized at the border. So Lucy had to write them a $1 million check from her mom's account and said, she's so rich, she won't even notice the money is gone. But they had no plans of getting that check cashed. Who has no plan? Lucy and Oliver is what the prosecution's arguing. Like, they have no plans. Like, they're not going to let Tyler and Jordan even have the chance to cash that check. Because they're going to kill them. Mm. It's just to buy a tiny bit of time. I see. Okay, got it. So they're like, okay, fine. Like, all that money that you invested is tied up in Europe. So here's a million dollars. Yeah. The Crown says, honestly, Lucy is a big freaking liar. They tried to go through every single thing she lies about, but it's a lot. So for example, at one point said she had no clue her SIM card had even been swapped. Unbeknownst to her, she just took her phone and left the house. Turns out her SIM card had been swapped. Yeah, but then they found text messages between Oliver and Lucy a few days before the murder. Mm -hmm. And they're texting about Chin. Oliver texts him, Chin said he can lend me his son, which sounds like an autocorrect for Sim. And that was three full days before the murder, to which Lucy argues it's an inside joke. Son is a nickname that they have for another friend who was supposed to drive him to the meeting that day. Which the prosecutors tell the jury is, quote, an elaborate story that's quite ridiculous. You don't have to be the world's greatest detective to figure this out. Two days before the shooting, there are messages between Oliver and Lucy where Oliver says, I hope those are words have money. They find it chilling that the day of the murder, the two of them are seen in the apartment elevator together acting like nothing's going to happen. They're like playfully pinching each other's cheeks. One big evidence of premeditation is Oliver tries to sell the Audi and Jordan's Range Rover weeks before killing them. Like imagine trying to sell a random acquaintance's car without their permission. Yeah, I think... You're, yeah. you're done. You're done. Like, there, what would be the reason for that? The prosecutors argue, what other possible reason could you have on planning to sell Jordan's luxury Land Rover that she had no intention of getting rid of unless you believe she wasn't going to be around to have a say? I mean, that also just shows they're genuinely not smart. Like, no. They plan the killing and they are genuinely that dumb. Yeah, because their defense is like, no, they're so dumb. There's no way they planned it like this. But it's, yeah, yeah. no, I think they're so dumb that they did plan it like this. Yeah. It, it's just evil. Like they're dumb and evil. Yeah. And that's a very scary combination. Lucy testifies during the trial that the prosecutors had stated she planned and deliberated what would have been a double murder. And she responds, I mean, that's ridiculous because I would never kill anybody. I would never be part of a plan to kill anybody. I would never be okay with a plan to kill anybody. If I had known, I would have put a stop to it. I married a man who shot not just a woman, but a pregnant woman as well as another guy. And I missed so many red flags and I continue to be in love with him. And I really feel like an idiot right now. She states throughout the trial that she was on the other side of the warehouse when it happened and she didn't know anyone had been shot. Yeah, except Jordan testifies. No, she wasn't. She was standing right there in front of the car when the shooting happened. I'm in the driver's seat. I couldn't talk. I couldn't move. And Oliver is staring at me. The prosecutors ask Lucy about this. And she said, they say, what Jordan said is the truth. And you know, it's the truth, don't you? No, I don't. Furthermore, a detail that prosecutors find interesting is a week prior to the crime, the couple purchased that Audi, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, that was used using Lucy's money. She purchases the Audi for Oliver. But get this, Oliver does not have a license. So why would she buy him a random Audi conveniently a week before the crime when he's not allowed to drive? He doesn't have a license. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any sense. Side note, he... He can't drive because uh, a while back when Oliver was 19 years old, he was drunk driving and this personal trainer of his name, David Chang, was in the passenger side. He was going double the speed limit, crashed the car, David Chang died. So he was sentenced to five years for a reckless DUI that ended in manslaughter. That's like the case we just talked about. Yeah, and he got 15 years of not being able to drive and five years in prison, which is absolutely nothing. 
So he can't drive. Why would she purchase an Audi for him? If they have no plans to murder anyone, what would be the reason of purchasing an Audi? She already has a Mercedes. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense. Lucy argues that Oliver told her it was for his flipping car business where he buys cars and ships them to sell in Europe. And she said that he promised to pay her back for it. The prosecutor says Lucy presents as someone with a carefully crafted script willing to say or make up just about anything to distance herself from every aspect of this plan. Not only was she aware of the plan, she was part of the plan. She was an active participant. The prosecutors state it is because of Jordan's strength and her courage that you can see the real Lucy and Oliver past all the lies. Perhaps without her surviving, they would have gotten away with it. That's true. But she did survive. Jordan states she was in a coma for three days. She lost her baby. She has severe nerve damage everywhere. The recovery lasted months of excruciating physical pain where she couldn't even move without someone helping her. Anytime she wanted to sneeze or cough because it was in her chest. This is dangerous. She can't just sneeze and cough like a normal person. Her mom has to hold a pillow down to hold her body in place. She had fake bones implanted into her chest. She has scars all over her breasts and her stomach. She had to relearn how to walk and even stand. She says, I live every day with anxiety and PTSD. I was so angry. I think the worst part was mourning him. She said she and Tyler were like one person. That's how close they were. And she lost him. She was angry. She says, to hear he suffered in the most gruesome manner makes me shake to my core. She said, yes, he was in the cocaine business, but he wanted out and he's kind. He has an even temper. He was down to earth. He always put his children first. But even then, she said the first day of trial, she was terrified to be in the courtroom with the couple. The last time she saw them, they were hunting her down in the Range Rover. Jordan states, I mean, it's crystal clear. Lucy was involved. She states, and I really liked Oliver. He was always so nice and caring. Tyler loved Oliver. It was a great friendship. He adored him. We considered them really good friends. And that's really embarrassing. It was all fake. It does seem like Lucy is involved. But I think most netizens are confused on why. Yeah. Right? I don't know if this matters. But this was an interesting comment that was posted by God knows who. So take this as seriously as you would take a hedgehog with a fedora on. This could be made up out of thin air, pulled out of someone's grass. One comment claims that they personally know Lucy, which anyone can post this on the internet without knowing Lucy. But they write, I knew Lucy for a few years, right before she got with Oliver again. She's rebellious and these things totally get her excited. She's always had money, but she wanted trouble. It was never about money. She did it because it made her feel good. That's why I distanced myself from her. Lucy's sisters are normal, but she's like a different breed and has always been. I totally believe she planned this with Oliver. There was another internet rumor that Lucy allegedly unconfirmed whispers in the air could be made up by anybody but it stated that she would do this thing where she probably had lots of wealthy friends right and um she would steal their expensive designer goods but not to use it she would steal it and then immediately trash it allegedly hmm. which is so weird i don't know if this is true would it be for the thrill would it be for the power of it hmm. i don't know Again, not proven to be true at all. But if it were, I think that's the only insight I could have maybe been able to put together. And again, it might not even be true, right? Because I don't know why she would be involved. Now, side note, it does seem like Lucy's character is confusing. Her morality is all over the place. Her attorney just attacks Jordan the entire time. He states Jordan is not a trustworthy witness in court because, well, she has questionable morals. Sir, he essentially goes on to state that with the mask factory that they invested in in Europe with Oliver, their whole business model is to price gouge hospitals during the pandemic while people are dying so that they can make a profit. So he's like, do you really trust someone who just cares about money like that? The defense attorney also asks, does that make her a good person? Then he states to Jordan, you let a fairly big drug dealer fly under the radar. That makes you part of the problem. Don't you see that? Jordan would later state, we wanted to have a family and leave that negative stuff behind. Then they try to discredit Jordan's version of events, stating that while she's truthful, she's unreliable because of the trauma that she faced. Which, yeah, but because of who did she have to face that trauma is the question here. What kind of question is that? Oliver's defense states, despite being there, Jordan cannot describe how Oliver shot Tyler. Yet she clearly remembers Oliver telling her to get out of here, Joe. Lucy's attorney states, Jordan has a moral compass so far off it should concern the jury. 
They keep bringing up the fact that Jordan claims to be a good person, but she was living in luxury off of the cocaine money and how she used to be a dancer, which I don't know, sir, with all due respect. What about your client? What's going on there? I don't think we can have a morality competition with anyone here. The state argues Jordan has been an open book and a consistent witness. She may have helped Tyler live off grid and benefited from his work, but no matter what you think of her lifestyle, it does not diminish her credibility. Jordan states throughout this trial, the legal teams have made Tyler out to be a scary monster, but you guys are the monsters. Side note, it's said that during the whole trial, Lucy would look over her shoulder and smirk at Jordan the whole time. Yeah. Dang. I don't know if that's true. But it's out there. Do you know if the mom and the family was there, present? Yes, but they never went up onto the stand. Um, The mom showed up in a fur coat and designer bags. Wow. Yeah. She does look kind of scary. I don't know. If Insang, Korean first impression, she looks intense. (laughs) Yeah. Everybody's family showed up, yeah. Tyler's family, Jordan's family, everybody was there. The jury takes less than an hour to deliberate. They were found guilty. People actually started cheering in the courtroom when the verdict was read. I think nobody likes entitled, spoiled people slut-shaming and shaming others when they're literally on trial for murder. I mean, the whole thing is frustrating. In Canada, a murder verdict is automatic life in prison with 25 years served before parole eligibility. And Canada is actually pretty good about releasing people so, on parole. So it doesn't seem like they're going to be there for life. The judge looked at the two defendants and said, it was an outright execution. It is difficult to imagine a more calculated and planned murder than what was conducted. Do we know Lucy's reaction in that moment? or She just looked kind of stoic faced and a little upset. The best part was when Lucy was being dragged back in, by the authorities because she's going to prison. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jordan said, bye, Lucy. <laughs> and Jordan says, because of how intense her trauma is, she is terrified of cars and loud noises. She said she was driving one time and she felt this insane PTSD anxiety where she felt like Oliver and Lucy were driving, chasing her, and she got into a car accident. For the first year of recovery, the only way she could fall asleep was to drink alcohol. And she just, she looked at the couple when she gave her victim impact statement and she said, the honest to God truth is, I'm not angry at both of you, nor do I want to avenge you, which would be a normal thought for a woman who has had a child and boyfriend taken from her, as well as a lifetime of PTSD and anxiety you have both inflicted on me. What I actually feel is sorry for you. I feel sorry that you threw away your lives for a lousy $470,000. It's pathetic. I remember exactly what you did to me, how you preyed on me and Tyler for weeks. My scars are a daily reminder that I survived what was meant to destroy me. My hope is that your lives will be nothing but a cold jail cell with the same jail food. And the worst part of all will be you alone with your own ugly thoughts. You will have to face your own evil self every day. But my life doesn't end here. It's just getting started. Yeah. During the trial, forensic pathologists stated that Tyler did not quickly pass. They say his wounds would have taken anywhere between two minutes to two hours. The judge stated he was left wounded and was alive possibly for up to a few hours after being shot, with no aid, no assistance being called on by the two offenders. Tyler's mom has stated, we've gone through a devastating time. We've lost a grandbaby through it, as well as our son. Tyler was a phenomenal father and a talented entrepreneur and someone who was continuously driven for excellence, just very hardworking. They said it was hard to listen to him being labeled as this dangerous criminal when he can't even be here to defend himself. For the past three years, Tyler's dad has been trying to get justice and he's been wearing his son's shoes every day for three years. And now that the verdict has been reached, he says that he will put the shoes back in the box because it was the closure he needed. And Lucy and Oliver are now appealing their convictions. And Jordan is suing Lucy in civil court as well as Oliver. So that is where the case is right now. What are your thoughts? I mean, why do you think Lucy was even part of this? It doesn't make sense. I just don't understand the psyche behind it. It doesn't even seem like her mom was going to cut her off. Mm -hmm. I think her mom has a lot of pressure that she puts on her children. But I think the children 
play the part well. I think Lucy played the part well. And I think as long as she kept playing the part, I don't think her mom had any plans to cut her off. Because I don't think that would have even looked good for the family, which it seems like her mom cares a lot about. I mean, I don't know them personally, but just from the few interviews I've watched of her. Mm -hmm. It's just weird. What are your thoughts? Why would she get involved? Let me know in the comments and stay safe. And I will see you in the next one.